This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with Masters of Horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Jonathan Jans, the author of books such as Marla, the Siren and the Spectre, and the Dismembered. And this is the second part of our conversation, so if you would like to listen to the first part, then do head back to episode 471. But as with all of these, you can listen in any order. And the previous episode, it got very heavy. Both me and Jonathan got incredibly vulnerable on that episode it was an episode that i was pretty nervous to release but i'd like to thank so many of you for reaching out for sending me messages of kindness and support and love and for being there for me during this very difficult time and for giving me some comfort after i put that out into the world so thank you. Now in this second episode with Jonathan, we do get more into the writing. We talk about literary agents, we talk about screenwriting, and we talk about pantsing and editing. So a lot of interesting things in this episode, but before any of that, a little bit of an advert break. Horror on Main, a new weekend convention for the horror community. This is Bram Stoker and Elgin Award-nominated author Jessica McHugh. And I'm hoping you'll join me May 26th through the 28th in Hunt Valley, Maryland, where I'll be a guest of honor and the featured poet at Horror on Main. This convention is like a love letter to the horror community, with writers, artists, actors, directors, pretty much anything you could want if you love the horror genre as much as I do. So come on down to Hunt Valley Memorial Day weekend, and I'll see you at Horror on Main. See HorrorOnMain.com for details. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. They're watching is The Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're Watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. Okay, with that said, here it is. It is part two with Jonathan Jans on This Is Horror. So before you were talking about how you'd relatively recently, or at least in the last four years, changed agents. So I wanted to know a little bit about the impetus for changing agent and how you landed your current agent. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think the huh, I, I think the first thing to say, and and this is going to sound like I'm choosing my words carefully, and I guess I am just because I don't want to throw any unintentional shade because there's no shade to throw. But I, I really feel like there are like you, you maybe a good analogy. There could be two perfectly like kind people, but that doesn't mean those two people are the right two people for each other. Right. Like in a relationship mm. or a friendship or whatever. And I think that it's it's difficult sometimes to to like let yourself let yourself accept incompatibility or to accept the fact that there is an incompatibility. 
And um, I am a kind of dance with the one who brung you kind of guy. Um, I've had, you know, I, I, I met my, my wife when we were 26 and we've been together ever since. And I just, I'm not, a, and I've been, I've been in one job. Um, I've been a teacher for a while now. I've been at the same school for 21 years. So it's not like I'm, I'm, and there's nothing wrong with people who like have a lot of change, like change can be really good, but I, I'm not somebody who experiences a ton of change in fundamental ways, I guess is what I'm saying. So when I got my agent back in 2013, 2014, um, she's, she was good. Like she was, she was a good agent. She, she had made and has made since then very legitimate sales. Um, really good at what she does. She gave, uh, she worked with me, for example, on the dark game, uh, which mm -hmm. is a book I'm really proud of and gave me great editorial feedback. She gave me really good editorial feedback on children of the dark. Um, so, uh, she was really good for me and good for me as a writer and, and good for my career. But, um, I just came to feel like we weren't quite compatible in our visions for my career in, um, I don't know, like there, I think the main thing is that like she had gotten feedback on a couple of books that she'd submitted. She didn't submit that many things for me to, to, to big publishers, just a couple things. But some of the feedback was that basically at that time, they weren't really looking for things that were overtly supernatural, like traditionally mm -hmm. horror, horror, right? What they wanted was things, again, this is the feedback she received. And then she imparted to me and then she wanted me to then um, apply to my work. And that, I think that's where the, the disconnect started to grow. But, but, but basically it was it needed to be something that could be construed as maybe supernatural, but maybe not. And I had to mm -hmm. leave whatever I was writing um, ambiguous enough for there to be that non supernatural interpretation so if one wanted to market it as purely a thriller or purely a suspense novel without supernatural elements, then one could do that. And honestly, that's a pretty specific kind of book you're talking about. Now, now there are a ton of ways to get to that, but that type of result for you to have a book that ends with there being no definitive proof of whether it's supernatural or not. Yeah, we can all think of books like that, but that rules out quite a few books, right? Yeah. It rules out quite a few stories and plots and ideas. And I didn't want to be really bound to that one kind of book. And basically she mm -hmm. was saying, and she was very like amiable about it. She was like, you know, I'll still like help edit with you and I just might not shop it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> so if, if you're not going to yeah. shop it, then what exactly are we doing here? Right. I know. <laughs> it, it, I know. It reminded me a little bit of that scene in office space where the Bobs are interviewing this guy and, and, and he keeps like being vague about what he's doing. And one of the Bobs finally says, what is it exactly you do here? Right. And, yeah. and I, I was kind of trying to feel that way. And, and again, that might sound negative. I don't mean to sound negative, but that's, that's kind of like the impasse we were at. And, and she would have been happy to continue to represent me as long as I was writing that sort of book. But I, horror, you two know this as well as anybody, horror is so vast. It's such yes. a broad, beautiful umbrella of limitless possibilities. I never want to limit myself. And I'm not saying that my agent, whoever that is, like my current agent, and if, if we stay together forever, great. If not, whatever, that's fine too. I'm not saying that whoever represents me is bound to shop everything I ever write, right? Because there are certain things that writers write that just aren't commercial. They're just mm -hmm. not going to be, they're better suited for a very small press, right? Or for a very specific type of publishing house. Um, and you know, I, I know that. So it's not like I'm naive and think that no matter what I write, she's got to submit to every publisher in the world. It's not like I feel that way, but I want that 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 freedom to go where the story takes me and that's another thing like i don't write with an outline i i i go and so how can i start a project at the beginning knowing that i'm going to leave it ambiguous right and i just i just knew that that wasn't going to work 
And so I really, I, I knew like a year before, maybe even two years before I ended up changing representation. I knew about two years or a year before that, that, that I needed to like deep down, my gut was telling me, you need to move on. This is not going to mm. work. But I was, you know, so I, I go back a lot of it's insecurity. I go back to when I was getting rejected by everybody on the planet, right? People I didn't even submit to were rejecting me just for fun. And I, and I, and I was like, you know, I don't want to go back to that. It's, I, it's probably the same fear that people have, like when they've been in a relationship, they don't want to be single. Right. I don't want to go back to the dating scene. That sucked. That was so mm. awful. That was so typical. I don't want to go back to those times. So I'm sure there was some of that. Right. I didn't want to take backward steps because I, I had to claw so hard to get to where I was. But um, ultimately, you know, talking to people, my wife had been saying it for a while. My kids had been saying it like, Dad, you need to move on. You need to get another agent. And, mm. you know, people like Joe, Joe Lansdale in phone conversations. Um, J Brian Keene was telling me that. Uh, and then finally, you know, and, and Ryan Lewis, you know, my, my manager my, for, for movies and television, he was always super diplomatic, um, more diplomatic than some of the other people I've mentioned. <laughs> like they were. Yeah. <laughs> So, they were so blunt like you know yeah i can't, I I can't imagine like, brian being right? <laughs> diplomatic and joe brian is a was not, shooter too <laughs> oh no, he was not the slightest bit like hold he wasn't holding back at all lansdale mm -hmm. i remember joe's i can't do his east texas accent very well bob you could probably do it but um <laughs> lansdale i remember saying yeah but i i feel like i've got to be loyal to this agent and lansdale was like he's like jonathan your loyalty is to your wife and kids to hell with that <laughs> other person. Right. I'm like, oh, okay. Is, Clarity. Uh, Clarity down. achieved. <laughs> right. I'm like, okay, I guess that makes sense. My, and it's true. Like that's where my loyalty is to my wife and my kids. So um, that, that was a really long winded way of saying that I realized that it wasn't working, but it took me longer to, to make that change than it should have. I finally did make that change. It was amicable. She's still a really good agent, still really knows her stuff, but just wasn't the agent for me. So then I went about um, querying agents, um, mm -hmm. trying to find a different one. Uh, ended up um, getting a lot, having a lot of conversations. Um, it went much better than the first time. Actually, fellas, super fast. That agent I just described was actually my second agent. And the one I have now is my third. I actually had a secret first agent way back in the day way before i was even like remotely ready to have an agent there was an agent who read one of my things and and liked it and decided to represent me and man and, and that guy he was the nicest guy but he just wasn't like he wasn't a big power broker let's just say that <laughs> mm, yeah <laughs> I was certainly not a power writer and we were only together for a very short time. And I look back upon that time with just kind of a weary affection because I'm like, you two knuckleheads, like <laughs> you were, you were no more going to make a sale together than, than, than I'm going to solve your cure cancer. I mean, that's like how, how far away from that goal we were. Neither one of us knew it. And he was nice and all that stuff. But boy, oh boy, that was way before I was ready to have an agent. So the one I have now mm -hmm. is actually my third. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, it's, it's new. It's relatively new. Um, I had several offers of representation this time, which is way different than the first couple of times. Um, and that was hard because like now you actually have people who want to represent you. And how the heck do you say no to any of them? Especially when you really super like love like four of them and really mm -hmm. want to work for them. So that was a super hard thing. It was a good, I, you know, it's like you never stop having problems. The problems just morph and change and hopefully sometimes yeah. become better problems. Um, but that's a, like, like we, you know, you all have had really like super big writers. I, I'm friends with super big writers and they have problems, right? They're just different problems. They're the problems mm -hmm. that, that most people would kill to have. Um, but there's still, there's still challenges. Um, so anyway, uh, I finally like made that decision about which one I was going to choose and, um, and yeah, so uh, I've been happy with her so far, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. And you said that there were four agents that you loved when you had these offers. So, I mean, what was it that made you go 
for the agent that you did or what were some of the considerations and factors when having to make what was obviously a very difficult decision? Man, I got to tell you, it was so hard, Michael. It was so, and it's still hard because I maintain friendships um, with with two of those others that I, uh, of those four, and, and mm-hmm. the other one wasn't like an angry thing. It's just, she's not on the same social media I am. But two of mm-hmm. the others I maintained like really good friendships with. And, um, you know, there was just never, it was, there was never anything wrong with any of them. And, and it was like, there were reasons to go with them. Ultimately, it came down to having to make a decision. I had to choose, like I couldn't, and I delayed it and I dragged my feet. And my wife and I had stayed up late talking about it. And um, ultimately, I, I guess I just, I, I, the, the one I went with, I obviously saw a lot of positives too. So I went with her, but it was, and it wasn't, a, a, the reason why it wasn't glaringly obvious is not because of any lack on her part. It's because of all the positives with really all four of them. And it's like, I could see myself being happy with any of the four. And, and honestly, I think if I would have chosen one of the other ones, I think that I would like them and be very mm-hmm. happy with the job that they were doing. I don't think that they would have done a bad job at all. Um, I just think that that, that, that I had to make a decision in the end. Uh, The one I ended up choosing was uh, really good. And um, I I, I perceived her, I guess, as a uh, as being a very passionate, like advocate for my work. And I like that. Um, And I I guess that's probably and it's not that the others weren't, but she was. So um, I think that maybe was the the thing that, that pushed me in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you've said that your second agent, yeah, she's a great agent. It just happened that, you know, you had to go your separate ways. You weren't in the end the right fit for one another. And I think that is so important, having the right fit. And it can be a difficult decision. But I mean, you want someone who really believes in your work, who's going to be a strong advocate for you. So, I mean, actually, when we get rejections from agents, that's a good thing because that means that they weren't feeling it. You want someone who's 100% feeling your work and really invested in it. And what you just said, Michael, is something that is going to make every querying writer, every writer trying to get an agent, roll her eyes like emphatically, but it is also a hundred percent true. It's not an easy thing to hear or believe, but it is a hundred percent true because if they do not have that enthusiasm, it is not going to work. It is not going to work. You're going to waste each other's time and it's going to end up causing more heartache down the road. So it has to be somebody who, who gets you, who loves your stuff who is excited about your stuff because this, I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the oxygen. I mean, that's the, that's what, cause this, this business is so hard. There's so many people vying for so few slots and editors are so overworked that, that you need that passion to cut through all the static and fatigue and outside factors that are, that don't have anything to do with, with writing good stories. So you mm. need somebody like, that to really like be in your corner through thick and thin. I think that's and so what you said was probably not what people want to hear, but oh my gosh, it's true. Oh, it's true. If writers don't want to hear that, then to me, it's, it's like, if you're trying to get an agent and your agent's like, well, I, I guess I'll take you on. I'm not going to go with that agent. Right. As bad as I would want an agent, I'm not going to do it. You know why? Because what you said, there's no enthusiasm. Your agent yeah. should be chomping at the bit to get your work. Right. Yes. They work for you, yes. not the other way around. That's right. And so That's right. they it's, need yeah. to have that, that enthusiasm. They need to be begging you, please. Yeah. You have to be good enough to get to that point. Yeah. And yeah. So it's the work's all on your part. It, it is true. I was uh, I, this summer. No, I, I think it was this summer. Time flows together, but I was up in uh, Michigan at, at uh, uh, Josh Mallerman, mutual friend. I think you all know. Yeah. Um, up, up at his house, and one of the reasons why I, mean, I went up there to see Josh, but I also went up there because Ryan Lewis, 
our manager was staying up there. Um, he'd, he'd visited and I wanted to, because I've known Ryan for a couple of years, but I'd never met him. And, um, Ryan and I, Ryan and I and Josh and, um, a few other people were sitting on this picnic table in Josh's backyard. And, um, somebody basically, somebody knew Josh. It was a friend of Josh, but didn't know me. Had never heard of me. Had never heard of my work, whatever. And Ryan started talking about my work and mm. I, it like, it like gave me chills. Um, because you know, again, who know Ryan can't control the market. Ryan can't wave a magic wand and just make people want to buy my stuff. And, and who knows, like something he shops of mine might not sell, whatever. But, but what matters is, what matters is, is that he loves it. What matters yeah. is, is that he's passionate about it. He was sitting there talking about it. And I got, I, I got like almost choked up. It was like out of body. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, he really means this. He really means mm -hmm. these nice things he's saying about me because the person to whom he was saying it wasn't somebody who was going to like acquire my work for film. I think it was like, this is just a buddy, random buddy of Josh's, but, um, yeah. you know, like that, that kind of passion can't be faked. It can't be feigned, but boy, when you find it, that is a really, really special, wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And actually I got a rejection from a literary agent the other day, um, an agent that, you know, I'd, I'd really wanted to land, but I mean, she just wasn't a hundred percent behind the specific story that I sent. And actually my, like in her rejection email, she said, and she absolutely nails it here. And it goes along with what we've been saying. You deserve an unequivocally enthusiastic agent as your advocate. And mm -hmm. that is a hundred percent right. And that is why, you know, we want the right fit for one another. That's what it comes down to. As you said, it's a hard truth. It's not something a lot of people want to hear, but actually we've been speaking about Ryan Lewis. My relationship with Ryan Lewis as my film manager is the reason that I've been looking for a literary agent because it's such a positive thing. His like belief in me, his guidance, his help, his support, his friendship. And I thought, you know, my main thing is writing books. Why do I have a film manager, but I don't have a literary <laughs> agent? I want some, I want the Ryan of the book world. And yes. well, now this is almost sounding like some sort of a weird kind of literary dating thing. And it's like, so if you're the Ryan Lewis of the book world, I'm here. I'm looking for you. Come find me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, seriously, Ryan is so positive. Ryan is, he's exactly the, the kind of person that you want to champion your work. And mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about what, what are the next steps for me? Cause I've, I had the girl in the video, the novella come out in 2020. And then later that year, me and Bob put out a collaborative novel they're watching. And I have, I haven't put anything out since mostly because of the personal stuff that has been going on in my life. I thought, you know, I'm not really in a position to kind of fully market and champion my work that I would want to. But I mean, sure. now, in, in spite of all the hurdles, it's like, look, I'm, I'm going for it because life is short and, you know, this has dragged on long enough and I can't put my writing career on hold. So I've started querying agents, looking into next steps. I'm writing a script with Bob where we're getting excellent guidance from Ryan. We'll probably jump into that in a little bit because I know you're doing a similar thing. And <laughs> so I thought, well, why don't I start looking for this agent? And I'm just trying to think what, what my next steps are. Cause I, I queried a few agents. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not going for a lot. Let's go for, for quality over quantity and then just sure. see what happens. And if I don't get a positive from, from those agents, then I, I've got a decision to make really. 
um, do I put out this novel that I've been shopping around independently? Do I find a press on my own or do I kind of keep querying? And there's, there seem to be different schools of thoughts. And of course, like everything in the writing game, there's not a one size fits all. So I know with right. Brian Asman and with his agent, you know, she was trying to sell his debut novel and he was independently publishing novellas. And I thought, oh, well, that, that's an interesting way to go because I think having the debut novel that has a little bit of clout so it can be a card to kind of sell to prospective publishers. But then also, I mean, I just want to get my work out there in the world. And there are countless examples of people who have gone with small press or indie presses, Gemma Moore being one example known for more than just drawing dicks in the sand, actually a very successful writer too. And, you know, her putting out novels independently did not stop her finding an agent or getting a traditional publisher. And I think what this boils down to is we're all, we're all looking for what is the formula, what is the perfect way of breaking in to the business or maximizing our opportunities for success. And actually the answer, the uncomfortable answer, like a lot of these things are, there is no one size fits all. There is no definitively uh, good or bad choice, only choices. So whether I indie publish <laughs> it, whether I wait for there to be a literary agent, whether I um, put it out myself, that they are all choices with different and uh, kind of different advantages and disadvantages. But certainly, if I put this out independently, it won't mean in the future, oh, no traditional publisher or literary agent will touch me. Because if there's like success, if you've got a good story, then, you know, keep submitting and eventually they're going to go for it. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yes. Well, I'm glad you said that rather than saying, actually, Michael, there is a formula. And here we go. <laughs> it's Jens's formula. <laughs> this is what you've all been waiting for. <laughs> Start taking notes. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I th no, what you said is exactly right, dude. I mean, that's exactly right. It, 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 I, I think that and this sounds super cynical, um, this little part, but I think that it is something to remember. I think that when we, yeah, the passion's important, um, but so often, you know, the the question comes down to this. Uh, let's put it this way. That's uh, in the realtor world where there's an agent. Um, you know, they're not going to be your realtor if you don't have a house to sell. And if they don't yeah. think, if they don't think that they can make money off you, if they think the property, the property that you're selling is not going to sell, um, and it's just going to be a blight on the landscape and it'll sit there with their sign on it, gathering dust and looking bad for them. They're not going to take you on as a client. Um, I think that, you know, with a literary agent, I think in, with an editor, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know that passion plays a role in all that stuff. But let's be honest, this is a business. And mm. when someone feels like they can make money off of something you wrote, they're going to take it on probably. Right. Yeah. And I think I think that you know, whether you are somebody who's published, you know, let's, let's say that somebody's self-published 17 books. If the 18th book they write is a, is a book that the, uh, that an agent feels like they can make a lot of money on, they're not going to say, oh, well, you have this stigma of self-publishing this number of, no, if they feel like they can sell it, they're going to sell that thing. They're going to do it gleefully and gladly. I think that we, it is important to be as strategic as, as we can be, but at the same time, I think that we don't have um, the power of prophecy. And I think that we can get into this cycle of overthinking and then being debilitated by indecision and worry and speculation. And, and this might be right, it might be wrong. Maybe they're, they're agents or publishers who hear this and cringe. For me, what I have, the, the realization to which I've come is I, and this sounds like such a platitude, it sounds so just fake, and, but, but I, I mean it. I am going to write something that I'm excited about. I'm going to write it as well as I can. 
And I am not going to write this to a specific market, to a specific trend, whatever. Yeah, I'm a reader, so I have an idea, a vague idea of what this market is or whatever. But if, if I try to make it about that, if I try to mm -hmm. make it about, you know, about the sale or about the type of advance I get or about who's going to ultimately publish this, if I think about all that stuff, that doesn't help me. All right. That doesn't help the story. That doesn't help me find the truth of the characters. So I find it best personally to not worry about all that and then to write the best stories I can. And then, you know, hopefully if I've if I've done a good job and gotten to the truth of those characters in that story, hopefully things will work out well. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, talking about not thinking about these things when writing. I mean, do you ever find yourself kind of because you, you said you don't have a plan, so you are pantsing the yes. entire novel. Do you find yourself, you know, coming up with things in the moment that then means that like even let's say a hundred pages through, you then have to kind of stop and edit the entire novel there and then to keep it consistent. Or if you have those moments, do you just make a note to do that on the second draft? I mean, what does this method look like practically? Yeah, I think, you know, it, what it ends up being is a really crappy first draft. All right. My first drafts are wretched. That's the first thing. And that's okay. Um, and the second thing is, is that they are Stephen King's formula. I think it was in on writing. His formula mm. is final draft equals rough draft minus 10%. For me, mm. it's always been like final draft equals rough draft minus 30%. Like right. there's a lot, a lot I end up cutting. And the majority of what I cut, you're kind of like alluding to this with the way you phrase that question, but it's from usually the first half of the novel where a lot mm. of that stuff ends up getting cut, changed, altered, whatever, to retrofit what comes after it. Um, but I just, I, I think that, you know, I, whatever. I, I'm sure I could, I could find aspects of my craft that I want to improve. But let me just say this, at the risk of sounding self-aggrandizing. One thing that I think people would say about my work, if they've read it, um, even if they come to it and read something, I think they would say that it's not, predictable. And mm -hmm. at least I think most reviewers would say that. I mean, some reviewers would probably say, well, I saw the ending coming from the first sentence. All right. And this guy sucks. Okay. You're always going to find people who hate your work or whatever. I think the majority of readers would say that they don't see everything coming um, in my books. Um, and that sometimes includes like major things like character deaths. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think the reason for that is because of the way I write. I think that because I allow for that organic discovery to take place, if it's unpredictable to me, it's probably going to be unpredictable to the reader. And, and I like that. I think that's a positive thing, um, personally, is, as self-aggrandizing as that sounds. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I wonder, too, because we've mentioned Ryan Lewis and we've mentioned script writing. So let's start at the beginning so in terms of how your relationship with ryan lewis came about and then what is it that you're working with him on at the moment yeah so uh what happened was this it's i cannot even begin to tell you um <laughs> this sounds so world weary and jaded but you know you see somebody um it, it's 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 just all part of the process. So, so somebody will say that they had this happen. And, and, and I don't even want to sound jaded about it because we should be excited about every little success that we achieve. Like, you know, if, if somebody if 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 an agent requests a partial manuscript from somebody, you should be excited about that. That means you wrote a mm -hmm. good query and a good sample. Right. So that should be excited. That should be exciting. And you, it should be celebrated. Um, I, I guess. You know, I, I've been to the point now where I've known Ryan for about like three years now, um, but I, uh, two or three years, I guess. But I, <laughs> I've had so many I've had a lot of like close calls. I've had a lot of people who have contacted me about my work 
And um, a lot of people have been really interested in my work from the world of movies and uh, television. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, something this for whatever reason doesn't come to pass or this for whatever reason doesn't quite make it over the finish line. Um, but it, it was one of those moments that led me to Ryan. So in a nutshell, super fast, what happened was um, I out of the blue got a got contacted by a major studio on one of my books. And um, I that was the first time that had happened. This is a few years ago. Um, and so I, I didn't know what to do because I hadn't had that happen before. So I um, contacted a couple people that I knew um, from like Twitter and whatever. I asked Brian Keene, of course. I asked Lansdale. And then I also contacted Josh Mallerman. And at that point, I don't even know if I'd met Josh. Maybe we had met at StokerCon, maybe at that point, but it was super brief. And all our interaction was online. But here's the thing. Uh, um, I'll just say this. Like, you know, you, you said some very nice things about me before the, sh you know, at the outset of the show about whatever, about my kindness. I feel the same way about you two just being, you know, just, just rays of sunshine. Not even, I know that sounded so cheesy, but it's true. Um, but uh, I, um, people, I think, don't realize how kind Josh Mallerman is. Like when they're talking about the nicest people in the business, I think they for the, the, I, I think he gets left out of the conversation because he's so successful um, because of, mm. you know, bird box and all the other things he's done. So what happened was, was that I, te I, uh, I tweeted Josh a message and I said that um, I got contacted by the studio. Do you have any advice for me? Do you have any things for me to do or not to do? And so I said, to, or he says to me, here was his response. His response was, well, this is obviously super exciting, but we have to be smart. Okay. And his response was, we have to be smart. And I, and mm. I remember at the moment he said that, that struck me as just an odd way to phrase it. I'm like, what do you mean we need to be smart? Like you and I don't know each other that well. We've only met in passing at a co conference like once, you know, what's the we that you're referring to? Mm. And, and basically from that moment on, Josh like took it upon himself to do every single thing in his power to help me in any way he could. It was just, it was the wildest thing. And he didn't, obviously he didn't do it. What am I going to do for him? Right. He's got a show on, he's got the, like one of the biggest selling movies in the history of streaming. And, and it's like, th there was nothing for him to gain by being kind to me. But what he did was he said, so we have to be smart about this. And um, let me make a phone call. I'll get back to you. He uh, gets back to me and he says, okay, here's the number for my manager. He's amazing. And he will help advise you. And, and at that point, I'm still thinking, okay, he's just going to help me figure out what not, you know, he's just going to talk to me and be nice to me and humor me a little bit as a favor to Josh. All right. And so he starts talking to me, Ryan, this is Ryan, of course, and we start talking and, um, you know, he advises me through this whole thing. And here's the irony of this. This thing ended up being a crushing defeat painful moment for me because what happened was this major studio this this person who reached out to me set up a call ryan and i talked for like an hour and he told me some things to say and not to say and some things to ask and not to ask whatever this person sets up a call doesn't respond doesn't even show up for the call that this person set up this person from this mm -hmm. major studio completely stands me i feel like the kid in an 80s movie, like a John Hughes movie who gets stood up at the prom. Like, right. I'm like, wait, I'm like so excited about it. My family's so excited about it because this has never happened to me before. And, and this person doesn't even bother like coming through on the Zoom call. I'm, and I'm sitting there waiting like an hour goes by, two hours go by. And it, I'm like Adam Sandler in The Wedding Singer, right? I'm like mm. sitting there at the altar. I'm like this, I cannot believe this happened. And I feel so foolish for getting my hopes up. I felt so like rejected and just silly. And so um, what happened was then, uh, and Ryan was like, you know, that I'm sorry that happened, but that happens. 
here's what you should do. And so basically I, I reached out and I set up another call with this person. We ultimately had the call. The person was late the second time on the call, still late, still finally showed up um, and seemed interested in this book, but then ultimately didn't get back to me. Um, so really the whole thing was just fraught with disappointment, um, except Ryan and I met through that. And then, um, and then I, I was like, well, you know, Ryan helped me through that little moment. That was nice of him. And so I go back to my normal life or whatever, but he like called to see how it went. And, um, you know, I told him it went horribly and <laughs> like, you know, that first time it went horribly and the second time it went better but then mm -hmm. nothing happened. And he was like, um, well, you know, w what else do you have? Let's, let's talk about it. And, and so he was the one who kept this, this like just tiny little connection on life support. He was the one who like, cause then I think by that time he'd read this book that the mm -hmm. studio had inquired about and he loved it. And he was like, that's, you know, I, I, I really love it. Let me see your, your, what else, what else do you have? So I sent him some other stuff, really enthusiastic about it. And then basically he was like, well, you know, it, it's up to you, but I'd be interested in representing you. I, I was like, you mean for that book that got rejected? And he's like, no, no, I mean, in general, I'd be interested in representing you. And it's like that out of body thing I talked about. I'm like, holy crap, this guy who's like, mm. again, he doesn't need me, right? He's doing so well already. He doesn't need me. Um, so the fact that he like loved my stuff and wanted to work with me, that, I mean, those are the kind of things that like, again, there, there was no monetary reward at the end of that particular thing, but just the fact that he believed meant everything to me and still means everything to me. And, and you, you can speak to that, Michael, you know, exactly yes. how that feels of him. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of a similar situation with me and Ryan as well, in terms of how we got connected. I mean, and and also, I mean, it, it speaks again to the kindness of Josh Malaman. It, you know, it's such a parallel story that it's almost not worth saying mine because it would be repeating yours. Although, thankfully, I didn't get stood up by a studio executive. So there is that. It's like the, the positives yeah. of your story without the negatives, which... I mean, I'm fucking sorry to hear that that happened, but unfortunately it does. Although, I mean, it, it just shouldn't. There's no excuse, really. You could send a little email to say, like, I can't make it, or, you know, even to say, I've changed my mind. I know that that's not ideal, but I've changed my mind, so I'm not going to be there. But, <laughs> I mean... What are you working on at the moment? Because I understand that you've now branched out into screenwriting. Now, is this the first time that you've jumped into screenwriting or were you doing some of this prior to your relationship with Ryan? Yeah, no, right. So what happened was, was that Ryan asked me, um, this is maybe 2020. He asked me, um, have you thought about writing screenplays? And I have to be honest because I, 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 I've taught film for like two decades now. Um, so at, the, at that time I'd taught for like 18 years, taught film. And um, I just always felt like it would be beyond me. I just always felt like it was something that I couldn't learn to do. And I, it's just whatever, insecurity, imposter syndrome, whatever, stupid doubt that I had in myself. Um, but it was just recently before that, that Lansdale said to me, uh, Jonathan, you need to be, you need to try writing screenplays. He says, you've got a cinematic style. I think it would translate really well to screenplays. Uh, I think you, you need to, you need to get on that. You need to try that. And this is right around the time I was talking to Ryan for the first time. And so, um, Ryan says to me, you know, have you thought about writing one, writing a screenplay? And I'm like, well, I wouldn't know where to start Ryan's response. And this is like Ryan and Josh, they're different people, but their attitudes are so similar. So Ryan's response sounded so much like Josh's Twitter response. Ryan's response was three words, exclamation point. I'll teach you. That was it. Or three or a contraction in two regular words. I'll teach you. Yeah. And it's like for him, it was that simple. I'm, he's like, you know, no, no. I mean, it was like you saying it would be easy, 
but but he was saying like yes this is feasible we can do this you can do this you know together we can do this and i'm like oh well maybe i can do this so he started to teach me and has been teaching me and mentoring me in screenwriting for the last whatever couple of years um so currently we are working on um an adaptation uh for a feature film of exorcist road which is a mm. uh, uh a possession, a serial killer slash demonic possession novella that I wrote. And um, we are working on adapting that for the screen. And it is going extremely well. And it's going so well because Ryan's awesome. He is like Gandalf and Obi-Wan and Yoda <laughs> rolled into one. He's brilliant. He's patient. He's insightful. He's creative, supportive. But like, it's always my work. Like, in, and I, he always liked, he, he always reminds me of that. So like, I remember the first thing I wrote, this is like the second thing we've written together that we've worked on, but I put um, by Jonathan Jans and Ryan Lewis because he'd helped me so much. I wrote it, but he helped me so much. And so I wanted to do honor to Ryan. And Ryan was like, no, 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 no. You're, my name is not going to be on there for that. I'm like, well, you help. He's like, no, 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 Jonathan, you wrote this you wrote this this is your work your name is on it and he's and that's just ryan he's so like like genuinely self-deprecating like there's no it's not for show like he genuinely like believes in the people that he works with and wants them to have ownership of it and wants it to be their vision and then he mm. like any good teacher coaxes the best out of you and it is, it is my work, but it's the best version of my work because of him. He coaxes the best out of me through his insight and his support. And it's just really kind of brilliant the way he works. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, from the screenwriting, how, if at all, has it changed how you approach fiction writing or how you approach storytelling? What are perhaps some transferable lessons or changes that have been made as a result? Oh, man, it is. There is such cross pollination between those. And, you know, it's a cross pollination of which I was aware, like in the abstract, because I like the, the classes I teach are film literature, advanced creative writing creative writing in English. And mm -hmm. obviously those are different classes, but they all have all these beautiful connections where they, where, where they are, you know, intimately intertwined. And I've for years known how like film, studying film can make you a better author of prose and how writing short stories can make you a better, more informed film goer. Like, so for years, I've known in the abstract that these things are really symbiotic, but it wasn't until I actually started to write screenplays that I could see, oh my gosh, you know, this is, and, and that's, I feel like I've become a better, like, novel writer through my screenwriting, and I feel like all the work I do on novels makes me a better screenwriter. Um, you know, just so many, yeah, they're different mediums, um, but it's like the particularity that's necessary, like the economy of language that's necessary in a screenplay helps me be more particular in my choosing of details on the page as, 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 a, as a writer of novels and short stories. It helps me be more efficient in my word choice. Even if I'm not in this interview, it helps me be more efficient in my choosing of words. And um, so it's made me a much more economical writer. Um, and I think all those years of trying to make things cinematic on the page have like prepared me for being a screenwriter. Um, they are so, so like nurturing to each other. I just can't, I can't tell you how much I love doing both. I love screenwriting. Obviously I love doing the other two because I've done it for a while, but I love screenwriting so much. It's something I always want to do, regardless of the success I have or don't have, I'm going to keep doing it because it's a blast. Mm. Yeah. Do you think in terms of your screenwriting, you're more up for purely adapting your work or do you like the idea of tackling a story as a screenplay initially just writing something you know originally in that format all of it all of it everything you said <laughs> yeah, in, in, yeah including 
including going back and then novelizing my screenplay. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I, all of it, all of it. I love that. And I, I want to write, I want to adapt my work. I want to write original screenplays. I want to then ad- adapt those things once those, once those screenplays are done. Um, it's just so, because it, each one is a little different, but they're all like just such purely, wonderfully creative endeavors and so fun, man. Like, you know, movies are so much fun. Good t- mm. television is so much fun. And so um, it's really like, and I've been, in a way, I've been preparing for that. And you all are probably the same way, but I've been preparing for that my whole life. You know, mm. when I was three and I saw Star Wars, the theater for the first time, um, you know, when I was with my mom watching The Twilight Zone as a little kid, just watching shows like Three's Company with John Ritter. You know, watching storytelling when I was a little kid, I feel like I've been preparing for this my whole life. Um, And man, getting to do it, getting to direct on the page is such a rush. It's such a blast. And then with Mm -hmm. Ryan there to kind of, you know, say, hey, this works really well. Nice job. Or how about we we revisit this? And how about we take another approach to this part? You know, and for him to then guide me to to find the best version of that, that story. Um, it's just so much fun. Like every facet of it is so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel with my limited experience adapting their watching with Bob. I don't know if we've said that on a public This Is Horror podcast before, but now we have. But it really does force you to absolutely put story at the forefront in a way Mm -hmm. that like, I mean, with with fiction, you can sometimes be a little bit self-indulgent, but you just can't. You have to be, there's no room for error. There's no room for kind of messing around. Everything has to be about furthering the story. And so in a way, I feel like we've created the kind of purest, rawest form of the story they're watching. And it, it demands that you focus in on story, that you make sure that every line is absolutely considered. And I mean, because of that, I could see, I mean, similar to what you said, if I was writing something as a novel and I was feeling a little bit stalled, I might be tempted to take the story and write it as a screenplay and then once I've finalized the screenplay, go back and adapt it as a novel, because then you you have got the ultimate plan. You have got the raw story there in screenplay form. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Which actually exactly. makes me wonder, and I'm putting you on the spot here, Bob, but I know that you've been struggling with a story uh, for the past few months. Mm-hmm. And you, yeah, you you decided like for a bit to abandon it to give it a bit of a breather, which I think is a sensible idea if something's frustrating you. But mm-hmm. would you consider, you know, when the time is right to revisit it, actually revisiting it as a screenplay initially to see if that's kind of what you need to get this off the ground? One hundred percent. That is that is actually my plan. I want to 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 set it aside, uh, and that was it was it was a tough decision. But you know, I mean, it's not the first time. It's not going to be the last time. Uh, I've got a project that that I've actually shelved, and so I'm reworking it. Uh, I feel pretty good about it, and uh, I'm gonna I'm going to to finish it. Uh, and then I'm going to take this, you know, story and uh, work it as, you know, basically a screenplay. Mm. And, you know, the thing, and we were talking about screenplays, the thing that, that the, the wildest thing to me is that screenplay structure is so rigid and, mm. and, and so, and so, I guess, I, and, and rigid is, is probably the wrong word. But it, it it's it's basically it, it's it's a form that you have to 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 kind of tighten your story with. The story comes first, and it's written in such a way that it's never going to be published. 
but you have to pay more attention to detail in it than you do in a novel. And I'm not saying that you can be sloppy in, in prose or anything like that. It's just that you, you're putting so much into, to, into the screenplay and it's not, it's never going to be published. It's something that you're using to sell an idea with. Mm. And the people who read these screenplays have read them all. They have read every one of them. Your job is to plant images in their brain to make them see the film that you're thinking. That's what the screenplay is. It's a selling tool. And to me, just the, the concept of that, it still blows my mind. Because, yeah, you can obviously find screenplays online. They get published with books and things like that. It's like, yeah, also now includes the screenplay, you know. So hmm. it, it's, but it, it's this format that that's really, you know, nobody's, you know, you're not going to Barnes & Noble going, I've just got the new script Stephen King <laughs> put out. I got the new Stephen King script, you know. Is it a movie yet? <laughs> nope, it's just script. You know, it's like to people who are unfamiliar with that, it's like, what do you do? Write a fucking play? I mean, what? What is it? You know? And uh, that would, Stephen King writing a play would actually be pretty cool, actually. But yeah. <laughs> if you're listening, sir, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can do that. Uh, you don't need my permission. Yeah. But it, it to me, it just blows my mind. It, it, and it still does. And, and, and working on this, this adaptation, I mean, Michael's even said, hey, when we get done, do you want to like re like redo the novel? And I'm kind of like, eh, no, but I, I, I see the allure of that. <laughs> you know, it's like I I really do see the see the the the, the temptation to take that, you know. Uh, but I mean, if somebody said, hey, you know, we're going to do a novelization, then I would probably almost demand, you know, if, if, if the mo if the script became a film and there was going to be a novelization of the script, then at that point, I'd probably be like, nope, me and Michael are going to write it. I just, I love the idea of you got the original novel, and now we've got a new story that is the script, because, of course, you know, the script is inspired by, but it's not like right. a direct, you know, like I mean, it, it's a riffing, really. So then mm -hmm. I, I know I like the crazy idea of then novelizing the script. So you've kind of got these three versions that are vaguely the same story and mm -hmm. all wholly different. And, and maybe it's a little bit self-indulgent, but also, you know, sometimes you have to indulge. That's right. <laughs> but I think that, that the, the new story would work good as a script. I really do. I mean, the one I was abandoning... Mm. I could see it as a film. And so that you, you, that idea was not planted. That was, it's kind of like, you know, in, in the background, I yeah. started thinking about that a couple of months ago. I was like, man, maybe I should just write this as a script. Yeah. But I have another script that, that I'm also working on. So, uh, and it's like, man, I just felt like I got too much stuff, you know, uh, going on. Mm -hmm. and so I just, it's better to shelve it. I didn't have a handle on the characters exactly the way I wanted them. Um, mm. and, uh, and this, this, uh, this other story, uh, just reared up his head, you know, in, in jealousy going, you, you've, you've abandoned me. <laughs> you know? I mean, I mean, I mean I think yeah. every writer probably goes through that feeling. It's my stories are jealous of each other. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, how yeah. about for you, Jonathan, when was the last time you abandoned a story? Hmm. Well, I've got one trunk novel, um, and I don't know if I'll ever do anything with it or not. Um, and I have a, uh, I have a novel that I've, I've set aside for a good while um, because I am uncertain about the ending I wrote. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally get back to that very soon and redo it. Um, so as far as just out and out abandoning something, probably just that, uh, that trunk novel. Um, there's, I guess there is another one that I started back in like 2013 that I abandoned because I wasn't ready to write it. It just wasn't working. Um, so I had to abandon that, but I'll probably get back to that at some point. Um, so I've done it before. It doesn't happen often, but I, it's happened a couple of times. I think if you do it long enough, it'll happen to just about anybody. That's my guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it's impressive that, you know, you pretty much pants everything and yet the abandonment rate 
is low, you know, because oh. it's, yeah, it can be a tough one pantsing it. Um, I mean, if I purely pants it, then it seems to go really well up until the 30% mark. And then it's like, oh, shit, <laughs> you know, where are we going now? We've got a hell of an opening section. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that if I'm if I'm being completely honest, I do think that there's this theory called the headlight theory where you can see a little bit ahead of you. Maybe, you know, a few mm. things down the road, a couple landmarks that that's probably more um, if I were to, to describe it, that'd probably be a little more accurate than the way I have described it, where I'm just completely blithely flying blind. I wouldn't say I'm totally blind. I, I would say that I, I definitely don't know for sure where it's heading. Um, I, mm. I might have a few ideas, a few little like turns in mind. Um, but still, like you're talking about, that is kind of a, a scary and exciting way to write because it means that you could quickly completely go off the road and crash. Um, it also means that there could be like a hidden passageway that you don't know about and you discover and it's mm. like, oh my gosh, this is really cool and exciting. Um, that kind of happened with Marla, to be honest with you. I uh, And the Dismembered, actually. Um, and Blood Country. I mean, really, all the three that have just come out recently, um, those three are kind of ones that I didn't really have that much of an idea of where they were heading. Um, and they ended up going to some surprising places. And honestly, as I, as I think about the majority of my work, I think that there, I think there are moments in most of my work that have surprised me. Um, and I think, again, I think that's a, a good thing. I mean, I, I'm sure I could find areas of my work that I want to improve, but I, I do, I do like that. I do, I do like that the, the, the characters, I feel like if you are, if you let the characters, um, breathe, uh, if you let them take the wheel that they will, and that they'll, they'll start taking the story, they'll drive on their own. Um, and then, you know, sometimes like in Marla, that book, there was a, there was a twist that I didn't see coming this character uh, that died, and I'm not obviously going to say which character it is, but I re re I resisted it a bit. Like I was so surprised by it um, that I like put the book down for maybe a month. I stopped writing it and I worked on other stuff because I didn't really want it to happen. And I was like, okay, I got to give myself time. I got to, I got to regroup because there's no way that this can be where the story's going. And I realized it was like after a month, like my like the the characters were still driving down that road in that direction. I guess they were like at the at the stop sign with the with the blinker on like, hey, dude, you know, we're ready to turn. Let's go. Let's get moving. You know, you have enough guts to do it. <laughs> and I was like, OK, I get I guess I do. I guess I have to because if I don't, it'll feel wrong. So I, I followed the characters to this really shocking place. And uh and I feel like the book is better for it, um, even though it was something that I resisted. Yeah, yeah. And I certainly get a lot of that. I mean, the novel that I'm writing at the moment, I've really planned it out a lot. And I think actually as a result of screenwriting recently, that has enabled me to see story in a clearer way, which made it easier to really plan and to put all of the beats in but then I found throughout the writing there are just these moments where it's like oh but that obstacle would would be a hell of a thing to put in or like imagine if that happened and it's like well now you imagined it it has to so it's made the writing infinitely more complicated and it's added a lot more obstacles but I think if your mind is presenting these ideas, then, you know, if you want to trust the story, then you should go along with it. Even if it makes the composition more difficult, it probably makes it a lot more interesting because, I mean, the plan can be a little bit pedestrian at times, but creativity in the moment just, I mean, literally delivers things that you couldn't plan for. And that's where you get the original writing and the original stories. So true. So true. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's funny, like you talked about planning out the beats. And mm. I forget if you were talking about a novel or a uh, screenplay. I think you said a novel. But, uh, yes. you know, as you know, like, w which one was it? Was it a novel? Uh, I, I was talking about a novel, of course. 
we yeah. do the same for screenplays, but in in a specific right. instance, it was a novel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I find just fascinating that Ryan. He really like the what I'm describing is a little bit counter to the way he works, because like with the with the beat sheet and all this stuff, like he will he uh, I, I, he sent me one that another writer had done and um, it was pretty specific about like the beats in the story. And, and I feel like and that's just the thing, too. It's like I think that there are places there are types of story. It all depends on the story. Like it all depends on the screenplay. It all depends on the story. Some stories are better, maybe plotted out. Like, and I, I, I'd never be dismissive about that, or like turn up my nose to that. Really, Exorcist Road is a novella. When I wrote that novella, I did plan it out. All right, so I have done mm -hmm. that before. And Ryan works that way with screenplay, where he wants you to really think the story through, where he really wants you. And I guess it's it, it it's worked for me really easily because you know the it's it's an adaptation of something that exists so it's easier to do that but i have a sense that even if i were working on an original screenplay he'd probably want me to put more thought into it than i do like long term with my novel i think that he would want me to plan out beats so there's this kind of grand design so you can make sure that everything mm -hmm. is heading towards something and i think part of that is because um screenplays are so much shorter right there's so, there, there's so few words in a screenplay and you can't spin your wheels for 14 pages right mm. whereas with a novel you can scrap a whole scene you can i guess you can scrap a scene in a, a in a screenplay but i do feel like with a screenplay at least in my experience you've got to be really you've really got to have a plan you've really got to have a good idea and it's funny that even like with a movie that doesn't seem like it has a plan you take a step back and it does barbarian is a movie that i saw recently and mm. um and i read i read like reviews of that which were in the, they're basically and maybe i'm wrong maybe the screenwriter maybe whoever wrote that had no idea where that was going to go and it just went off the rails and went all these different directions and all that was just a happy accident um for me and maybe this is in the editing process for that screenwriter for me i'm like that all clicks so well like this opening mm. scene works so well with this ending scene, like this detail that was probably on page seven of the screenplay works so well with this detail that was probably on page 91. Um, and so I feel like that, that, that even when a story seems to be going into these chaotic directions, if it's a well-written story like that one was, I feel like that it's either, either there was a plan or they so, persuasively and effectively edited it that it felt like there was a plan all along um because mm. I, I don't know that, like so my screenwriting process is very different than my novel writing process i don't know about you um but for me they're very different oh yeah yeah i mean i think i think they have to be as we said with there just not being that room to kind of be so self-indulgent i'm not sure if that's quite the way to phrase it but hopefully you know what i mean with the, the oh, screenplay and no, it being so. yeah absolutely no i think that's what you're doing like we, like the way i write novels it's like i'm just going i'm having fun i'm not worried about this or that but with the screenplay i'm thinking like really hard about this particular line of dialogue and i'm and i'm sitting there at the computer looking at that one line of dialogue you know making sure that it's going to set up what's on the next page um so at least for me i don't know about for you michael and bob but for me man that they, they really are different processes mm. yeah 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 i feel that they are thank you so much for listening to part two of the conversation with jonathan jans join us again next time for the third and final part but if you would like to get that ahead of the crowd if you would like to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to each and every episode, but you get a number of other perks, including becoming a part of the Writers Forum on Discord, exclusive patron only podcasts such as the Q&A sessions with myself and Bob Pastorella, and Story Unboxed, a horror podcast on the craft of writing, in which we 
analyze and dissect a variety of short stories and films. And of course, you get to submit questions to each and every interviewee. And we have a number of exciting guests that we are confirming now for the end of this year and the start of next. So plenty of reasons to become a patron. You also get to support us and to help keep the show alive. So it is patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Head on over, see what we offer. And if it's a good fit for you, then I would love you to join us. Now, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night, she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon, Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. They're watching is The Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. Horror on Main, a new weekend convention for the horror community. Exploring all the shadows of horror, our guests include writers and actors, but also artists, publishers, directors, composers, and more. We've been going to cons for over 20 years and are changing up the little things to make the big picture amazing. Beyond guests, contests, movies, panels, and podcasters, our layout and programming are designed to further incorporate the very idea of community. Join us Memorial Day weekend 2023 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Come to the block party and meet your new neighbors. HorrorOnMain.com Now next year is a very special year for the This Is Horror podcast because it is going to mark... 500 episodes and 10 years of This Is Horror podcast and we are hoping to do something special. We're looking at different guests that we can get on the show, dream guests as it were. So perhaps rather than just having one big episode 500 which we'd like to, we might have a whole month or two of these dream guests that we've wanted to get on the show. And of course, if anybody out there knows how we could get Stephen King on the show, if you have a line to Mr. King, then do let me know, do let us know, because Stephen King is basically the number one guest that we would love to get on This Is Horror. He's the number one guest that everyone wants to get on their horror fiction podcast. But if ever there was a time to do it, then it is now. For the 10th year, for one decade and 500 episodes. Of course, Stephen King doesn't need to go on a podcast. He doesn't need to do any promotional thing for the rest of his life. He is going to sell millions of books every time he publishes something. And so that makes it hard to get somebody like Stephen King on the show. Because what is the pitch? What is it that we could possibly do for Stephen King that he cannot do for himself? I'm not sure that there is anything, but we would love to get him on the show. It is a lifelong dream. I should backtrack. It is a podcast-long dream. I didn't know when I was born I was going to have a podcast, but it has been a dream from a very young age to talk to King and... Me and Bob are both huge fans of his work. So, a bit of an odd one to put that out there, to almost manifest it into the world. But if by chance anyone is listening who might be able to help us make that happen, then please do get in touch. Michael at thisishorror.co.uk Now, I'm sure that a lot of you by now have seen that the This Is Horror Awards have been announced. And they will be running until early January. So if you head over to thisishorror.co.uk forward slash awards, you can see what is up for a This Is Horror Award. And all you need to do is email in your votes. This is a publicly voted horror award. So the most 
votes in that shortlist of the five in each category is going to win the award. So this is very much a horror fan driven award. So we want you to be a part of that. We've already got a lot of votes that have came in. And for once, we're really on top of it and we're counting them as they're coming in almost. But we need your help because we want to make sure that as many people in this wonderful horror fiction community get their vote registered, get their voice heard, so we can really celebrate who's written the novel of the year, who's written the short story collection of the year, what is the fiction podcast of the year, the non-fiction podcast of the year. So a tremendous amount of categories. Head over to thisishorror.co.uk forward slash awards, check it out and get those votes in. And that really does do it for another episode of This Is Horror. Thank you for joining us for this wonderful journey, this roller coaster of a journey with Jonathan Jans. Part one was the heavy stuff. It got a little bit lighter in part two. And in part three, coming up next episode, we're going to jump more into the writing. We're going to talk about the latest release of Jonathan's, The Dismembered. We're also going to talk a little bit about the release before that, Marla. And we'll jump into some of those Patreon questions that fantastic patrons have submitted. So join us for that. But until then, take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing. And have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.